I will introduce Lexi, who will then introduce uh, Virginia. Lexi is a former senior contributor for Two Young Voices. We were very pleased to have her in our program for a year. Um, she is uh, started her own project called Civic Renaissance, kind of starting to encourage uh, the importance of a civil uh, civil uh, conversations and civic society in the U.S. And uh, her she has a forthcoming book called uh, Against Politeness, which will be published in St. Martin's Press. So I'm very excited to turn it over to Alexandra Hudson. Thanks, Casey. Uh, delighted to be here and delighted to be having uh, this conversation with Virginia Pastrell, a, write, uh, an, a writer I've admired for a really long time. Virginia is formerly an ed editor of Reason Magazine, uh, formerly a columnist for The Atlantic, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, now a columnist at Bloomberg, and is the author of several wonderful, wonderful books, including The Power of Glamour, the Substance of Style, The Future and Its Enemies, and most recently, which we will talk about today, The Fabric of Civilization, which I have right here, How Textiles Made the World. Um, so Virginia, it's great to have you here. You're someone that um, many of us hear your name we recognize and, and admire. And before we get started, just to kind of thread the um, thread the loop uh, uh, from, 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 for a number of your um, books, like you, you are, what I love about your body of work is that you are a classical liberal and, uh, you know, libertarian, you are head of Reason Magazine, but you don't write exclusively about classical liberal things like tax policy and trade kind of that are more um, squarely in the modern libertarian wheelhouse. And you've written two books on beauty and your latest book is a history of textiles and just asking broad questions of, of civilization. And I, I, I want to hear more about um, before we get started. Um, how 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 your uh, ideology, how your first principles inform um, inform your interest in these other ideas and in beauty and questions of, of humanity, and and just how how we might all um, benefit from kind of uh, learning learning from you in that way. Well, first of all, I think you know my work is squarely in the classical liberal tradition. That is, if you go back to Adam Smith and David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, they were wrestling with a lot of the same questions that you'll find in my work. Uh, um, you know, what is the nature of uh, a commercial of, of life in a commercial society? Um, what are sources of value? How do we relate to other people? I mean, it's just classical liberalism is not just about the government <laughs> it's about a certain way of sort of thinking about the world that evolved very much from the development of a certain kind of um commercial society and where limited government was a part of that but wasn't the only part of that so in that sense, I mean, I follow my interests, uh, especially when you're going to do a book, you're going to live with it for a long time. So um, you need to find something you're really interested in. And, you know, I'm interested in questions of innovation, questions of, of value creation, questions of why people buy things they don't need, uh, questions of how people um, find, I don't know what to say, like the, the, the power of glamour is not really about beauty, it's about rhetoric and about dreams. And um, so that sort of thing I'm interested in. So it's that I would say it's not that libertarianism informs my work it's that my work at reason and my work in these books stems from similar interests and concerns uh, so that the the nature of life in a free commercial society um, and how to make that better and how to uh, find individual fulfillment in that is at the heart of it. I love that. 
I love that. It's important to remember that classical liberalism is not just about government. It's a great line. Thank you, Virginia. Um, so your book is about textiles, uh, the fabric of civilization, how textiles made the world. And you have this incredible sweeping history of, of um, just, just how fabrics have been a part of, of humanity since kind of the dawn of, of the historical, at least written record. Um, so I'd love to hear- Long before that, actually. <laughs> right, right. So tell us what's different, textiles now and then, kind of a broad open-ended question to get us, get us started. Well, uh, okay. So you're right. The book goes from prehistory. The earliest thing is actually 50,000 year old string to the near future. So I talk about people who are working on embedding uh, computer chips into fibers that can be knitted or woven into fabrics, uh, people who were looking at new materials, uh, bioengineered silk and bioengineered protein polymers in general, all kinds of so. So it's a huge sweep and it's also international. And we can talk about, if you want, the challenges of organizing such a, an ambitious project so that it's, you know, you held it up. It's a normal size book. It's not a library. It's not 15 volumes. It's not an encyclopedia. You can read it in, you know, a couple of days. Um, so the biggest change, uh, I, I would say there's, it depends on when you say now and then, but the biggest change is that textiles have gone from being very precious and scarce to being extremely abundant and taken for granted. And they've gone from being the center of a lot of economic activity, um, both in the marketplace and in household production, and uh, to being still a very, accounting for very large numbers of, in, you know, of, uh, of output and, jobs around the world and such, but a much smaller percentage of the total activity in in economies in general. So those are the those are the two big changes that have taken place. And they they start in the late 18th century with the Industrial Revolution, where suddenly spinning thread goes from a huge bottleneck in the production of thread, some uh, in, in the production of textile, something that basically women all over the world spent all their time spinning because you never had enough thread. And, and one of the things that people tend to be staggered by is just the amount of thread it takes to make anything. So if you take a pair of blue jeans to weave that denim takes about six miles of thread and to spin that much thread before the industrial revolution if you were the fastest you know using the fastest technology and and the most skilled spinning uh, ability uh, which was Indians spinning cotton on the charka, it would have taken a hundred hours to spin that much thread. So you can see why even very ordinary fabrics, not to mention things like silk, but ordinary fabrics were very expensive. They were, every little scrap was used. They were handed down. Uh, you know, when you had a uh, a trousseau when you were getting married to have household linens was a big deal all of this and that really continued i mean the industrial revolution changed that and it rippled through society because it's not just clothes and linens and stuff it's also sails and sacks and all kinds of things that are used in uh, other aspects of economic activity but it's really it you start then to get incremental progress and you also have a big leap in the 19th century with the development of synthetic dyes and then in the 20th century with the development of synthetic fibers. So you have this kind of increasing, increasing, increasing uh, abundance and also quality in, in many cases. I mean, or at least the potential for quality uh, in, in, in there's always a cost quality trade off. And now we're in a, a, a world where to some degree, because people, textiles are so cheap and abundant, people have started to treat them as disposable and maybe less concerned about the quality. And there's some pushback from that, especially with people being concerned about the environmental impact. Yeah. 
That's really interesting because the history of textiles is kind of one that of democratization that tracks a lot of other kind of broad social trends, whether it's like political equality or educational opportunity. Like we're far more uh, enfranchised today than we were 2000 years ago, uh, far more educated than we were a few thousand years ago. Um, and it's interesting how you how you mentioned that textiles were once the purview of only the elite in society, those that could afford the rare, um, sumptuous, uh, expensively created textiles. But today, it's something we we take for granted. I, I kept coming back to that over and over. That thought of how much I take for granted as I was uh, reading your book, Virginia. Um, I love I love uh, you know six miles of thread to go into blue jeans and and somewhere else like. Is it, you know, 100 miles that goes into the sheets that we sleep on? Yeah, at night? Right, right. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. And and then since you mentioned luxury textiles, let me just <laughs> sort of throw in a, in a couple of things there. So, for example, velvet. Um, I wrote about this around Christmas, but, you know, velvet is something we don't wear it a lot, but it's it's something you don't think of as so expensive you couldn't afford it. And velvet is actually quite difficult to weave. Uh, it requires having like little tiny rods that go through little loops and it, it's it's very complicated. Um, and now it can be done on power looms and, you know, put out hundreds and hundreds of yards very quickly. Similarly, any kind of design that is woven into something. I mean, I went to a factory in China where they were weaving kind of hideous uh, things but little you know little rugs and cutesy pillows and things that you might find in the you know gift department at Walmart uh, around a holiday um, you know and, and very affordable but that's the kind of thing that used to be you know only the king or the bishop could have <laughs> because the pattern was so complicated to make um, and and that's that was the jacquard loom, which some people may have heard of in the history of technology because of its use of punch cards and the, the idea of digitization. But really, weaving has always been a digital, a binary process because you're either lifting a thread, or you're either going over a thread or under a thread. There's always this one zero uh, process to it. So, yeah. Hmm. And um, part of your argument is that textiles produced the affluence that uh, civilizations across history have used to produce culture, to be patron of the arts, to, to um, create art or, or civic institutions. Um, and I, I particularly loved your, your discussion of, of Renaissance Florence. And I'd love to uh, I'd lo tell us more about that. Well, Renaissance Florence was built on the textile trade. Uh, in, in that period, textiles in Italy were the major industry after agriculture. Um, and also Italians not only made textiles, uh, they traded them throughout Europe. And this led to, first of all, a great deal of wealth, uh, which funded the Italian Renaissance, uh, the humanist scholarship and the art that, you know, passed down. It also led to some new institutions, which were very influential. Uh, you mentioned education. The, one of the things that was spreading in that period was the use of this really innovative way of doing calculations, which was with a pen and paper using Hindu Arabic numbers instead of Roman numerals. So you had zeros and you had these, these placeholders and base 10 and all of that. And instead of using an abacus and I mean, people used to do arithmetic with Roman numerals, sort of think about that. That's not very easy to do. And so they, the, these Arabic numbers started to spread and these methods of calculation were being invented. All those things you learned in elementary school about how to add things up or do division or do multiplication. And this was extremely important in the textile trade, which also was developing double entry bookkeeping and spreading new methods of accounting. And people started these schools where kids, mostly the kids of families that were in, the, in commerce, mostly textiles, but not exclusively, would send their kids to learn for a few years 
these techniques and basically they would do all these word problems about if this much cloth is worth this and this much you know salt is worth this what is this much what's the exchange rate and they also did a lot of foreign exchange because every like every city state had its own currency and there's a lot of calculations involved so that was the first kind of arithmetic school they were called abacos even though they're not about the abacus it's like the opposite it's not using the abacus and it was the first time people made a living doing math in in europe um people could teach and then on the side they would do consulting mostly for construction projects and then also uh people developed new mail services they developed uh, new ways of uh, moving currency, new financial uh, instruments, which I won't go into because they're complicated, but uh, just think that it's a little hard getting sacks of gold over the Alps. Maybe you would find a way to do it with pieces of paper and using banks, and that then develops uh, into the, the sort of origins of, of modern European banking. So you had a lot of things that rippled out of the textile trade from that Italian base throughout Europe. That's fabulous. Um, I know the origin story of this book is you first wrote an essay, right? You wrote, wrote an essay on textiles and fabric for Eon magazine and, um, and then an editor, book editor reached out to you and said, hey, do you want to write a book? on this topic, which is kind of the dream for many of us here uh, who are write, writing a lot of essays and op-eds a lot. Um, but I mean, just because an editor reaches out to you and says, hey, you wrote this essay, that doesn't necessarily mean that you want to or should spend you know, up to three years of your life working on um, a book project. And so I'm curious, what was it about this um, topic that, um, well, uh, that, first of all, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the original essay, if you could share that with the group. And then also like, what was it about the, um, the topic that that kind of you knew would sustain your interest to to produce a full book. Yeah. Well, the the essay was something I'd sort of been noodling around the general idea of doing for a long time, inspired by some exhibits and conference papers and such that I'd heard uh, that that was just an interesting something interesting to be written about textiles and technology. And then a friend of mine who at that time was the uh, fashion curator at the Phoenix Art Museum said to me, hey, Virginia, if you're really interested in writing something about textiles and technology, the Textile Society of America is having its conference at UCLA and you should go. And UCLA is like a mile and a half from my house. And, um, and so I did, and I heard some amazing talks and it was really interesting. And the essay came out of that experience. Um, and I then, you know, with some help from a friend, uh, another friend, pitched it to Aeon. Actually, somebody introduced me to the editor. Um, and then, as you say, uh, after it appeared and people really liked it and was circulated quite a bit, um, I heard from an editor at Basic Books who said, gee, you know, we'd love to do something uh, on this. Would you be interested in doing a book? And at that time, I wasn't ready to do it because I didn't know enough. I thought, it, to answer your question about why this topic, it's a big topic and it touches on a lot of my interests. And I, I did think it would be a good book. And I had in the back of my mind before that, that I would like to do a book, but I wasn't ready because I needed to learn more. And I also needed to write a proposal and I needed to organize all this material. And actually what happened is the first proposal I wrote um, partly on the advice of a friend, a writer friend, I really concentrated on what was happening now because I thought that would be more commercial. And um, I had written, and in the meantime, between that Aeon essay and this proposal, I had done some articles for Bloomberg about wearables and I even wrote a piece for L about the measured life and don't ask me how to write for L because all those <laughs> editors are gone. Uh, yeah. um, but so I wrote a proposal that each top, each chapter was a topic and it foregrounded something contemporary. And then when we shopped it, the feedback from basic and also from others was 
no, we would really, we what we really are interested in is the history, which was also what really interested me, although I was interested in the contemporary stuff. Um, but that made the challenge of organizing it much harder hmm. because when you're mostly writing about things today, you can start with what are the big things today and each one can inspire a chapter and you can kind of do it from that. When you're talking about from prehistory to the near future and all around the world, oh my God, it's, a, you know, how do you keep that from being a mess? And what I came up with in the first proposal was a, a series of, of themes uh, for the different chapters. And what that evolved into was a sort of warp and weft structure where each chapter takes a step in the, the journey of from fiber to finished cloth to in the marketplace. And then, uh, you know, so it's fiber, thread, cloth, uh, fiber, thread, cloth, dye, traders, consumers. And then there's a chapter called innovators, which is about some of the stuff that's going on today. And each chapter then also has one of these themes that I wanted to discuss, like the one on chapter, uh, the one on fiber is about how humans alter nature and there's no such thing as natural fibers. The one on thread is about some of this work idea that I touched on before. The one on dye is about the history of chemistry. Uh, the one on traders is about the evolution of some of these commercial and social institutions that allow trade. So each chapter by having not just a topic in the textile journey, but also a tight theme that limited what I could write about in that chapter. And that kept it under control, but it also allowed me to span time and space. And each chapter more or less starts earlier and goes to today too. I tried to sort of have that arc in each chapter as well so there was a really a lot of thought about organizing it and so that's when that was the ult there was a proposal that sort of mostly had that but some of that actually worked out when i started writing early on but um yeah hmm. i mean i it's a i can imagine the challenge of organizing a book about, about a subject that literally touches every era every culture and every facet of kind of the human human experience. Uh, how did you decide what not to include? Uh, like, did you have p subject matter experts from different fields or friends read over it and tell them, them tell you what is interesting? Or did you just kind of go with what you thought was interesting? Just how do you- no, I went with what I thought was interesting. Yeah. I mean, I did have people read things along the way, but that was more about um, accuracy or just general feedback. It wasn't really about, like nobody said, oh, this is interesting, this is boring. It wasn't so much that. Um, but it was really that structure. So for example, um, I wrote a big section in the dye chapter about, ha about alum, which is a, a mineral salt that's used to make dyes adhere to fabrics. And it's really important from ancient times. Um, and after the fall of Constantinople, uh, Europeans and Christendom, they didn't want to trade that that was the big source of of alum was in, in those territories. And they didn't want to trade with the Ottomans, but they sort of had to because of alum. But then boom, a big alum deposit was discovered in the Papal States. And so then there's this whole history where the the Pope tries to monopolize alum in Europe. Uh, like you had to buy from the papal states or you'd be excommunicated, you know, they threatened people with excommunication. And, and, you know, you have to remember back in those days, the Pope wasn't like the Pope today. It was like, a, a, he, was, he, he was the head of the church, but he was also a secular power. So there was a lot of stuff going that, you know, had big territories. And stuff. So I wrote this whole section about the Pope trying to monopolize alum. And it was really fun and interesting. And it then I realized this doesn't have anything to do with the history of chemistry, which is what this chapter is about. 
So fortunately, I was able to publish it in Reason. <laughs> but so you can go on Reason's website, or actually, it's on my website now too, uh, and find this article about alum. But that was from the cutting room floor because that was like, wait a minute, I find this interesting, but it doesn't fit with the specific story that I'm telling in this chapter, which is about the history of chemistry and is about how how much about the limits and the uh, the power and the limits of trial and error experimentation without fundamental understanding uh, of the science underneath. And that's sort of the thing. By the way, this is a very sciencey book, and I actually got support for it from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, uh, which has a, a program for, um, I forget what it's called, the public, not communication, but anyway, for it, for the support of sort of popularization of science, technology, and economics. And this book is all about the popularization of science, technology, and economics. So it was very much in their sweet spot. Virginia, I think that's a really encouraging um, story you told to the audience uh, you're talking to right now, because we're, a lot of us are writers and a lot of us, you know, we write a piece on a news hook and then it's old. We don't get it placed in a few days. All of a sudden it's old news. And then, you know, we can't use it anymore. No one wants it anymore. But like this, this notion that no writing is ever, ever wasted, that you can always find a way yeah. to repurpose that. Well, I, this I, is the, I mean, you know, yeah. we can talk to, I mean, the book is very different, but you know, there is this problem with People like news hooks, but they go stale. And I have the same, I mean, I have, I'm fortunately have the blue, this Bloomberg column obligation, fortunately or unfortunately, sometimes <laughs> it feels like, blah, I'd rather write about textiles, you know, I'm writing about Gavin Newsom. But, uh, but, um, but, you know, fortunately I have that, but there is this problem of how do people want news hooks and then they don't get back to you and, this, this started, it, it didn't used to be such a big problem, like in the 90s when I was editing Reason and I was writing a lot for the LA Times, it wasn't such a big problem. But the more people got fax machines, the bigger a problem it became because then the, the op-ed places started to be swamped. And then, of course, they got email. <laughs> and now they just can't keep up with it. I mean, on the other side, they can't they can't read everything. So then, you know, it's always been important to know editors, but it's become all the more important. And I, I, from what I understand, I mean, part of what Young Voices is doing is connecting people with, you know, making those, those, making that network so that people, you know, get their stuff to the top of the pile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it's true. I mean, it, 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 when I say when something isn't wasted, it depends on the nature of the something. I mean, and you may never publish that exact thing, but you might publish something similar or you might get the practice of it or you might get introduced to somebody who says, I'm sorry, we can't publish this, but, you know, you're a good writer and let's keep in touch, you know. But I've had plenty of things that, you know, never saw the live day. <laughs> Uh, well, that's why it's important to remember that writing is a creative process that is beautiful and good for its own sake. <laughs> <laughs> um, Virginia, I'd love to hear your story of what drew you to classical liberalism and a little bit about your story to public intellectualism. You're a lot of, you're someone that a lot of us admire and respect your journey. And so if you, you, if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit about your story, it'd be wonderful. Um, yeah. So I was always, okay. So in my youth, like before I went to college, I was very much, I was very much of a civil libertarian. I was a liberal, you know, in the conventional American sense. Um, but I was very much of a civil libertarian like John Stuart Mill, uh, always had an appreciation for the um, the rights of the minority, um, the fact that you can't just have majorities run over everybody. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the 1970s and, uh, you know, I was born in 1960, so, but uh, my teenage years were in the 1970s, which was a period of great economic stress because of 
what came to be known as stagflation, which was the combination of high unemployment and high inflation. And none of you have ever experienced a world with high inflation or inflation in general, and certainly not the combination of inflation and very steep graduated progressive taxation. So that meant that like, if my dad got a raise at work, it sort of vanished because um, between inflation making the the value of it vanish and then he would get kicked into a higher tax bracket. So he would have, and he was an engineer. I mean, I didn't, I didn't grow up poor, but I didn't grow up rich either. You know, I was definitely squarely in the middle class and there were four kids and, you know, so it was very stressful. And also there was a sense that nobody understood what was going on. Like nobody had a good explanation for why all this stuff was happening. Um, so when I went to college, one of the things I did was I took economics, um, even though I was an English major. And another thing I became, I came under this influence of a very important person, which is called Stephen Postrel, who was my boyfriend. <laughs> and you can guess from my name has been my husband for almost 35 years. Um, and he was very much a libertarian. And, and so then he introduced me to various writers, um, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, who was, Milton Friedman was very prominent then. Um, and he was the one person who could answer that question of what the hell was going on with the economy. Um, anyway, so we started reading, all, I mean, he had read a lot of this stuff. He introduced me to a lot of things. Um, and then also um, simultaneously with that, I just started reading think magazines and I had been reading, I think the Washington monthly at that point. I mean, this was a long complicated story where like, this is so nerdy, but my high school boyfriend gave me a subscription to this weekly newspaper that was put out by the wall street journal that was more featurey. And then it went under and they substituted something else to fulfill the obligation of the subscriptions, which I think maybe was Harper's. And so I was reading that. And anyway, so I was reading all these magazines. And at some point, I think in our maybe junior year, Steve discovered Reason in the library. And I was like, wow. And so I wanted to be an editor of one of these magazines, which was kind of inspired by the, not more than kind of, uh, it was inspired by reading this book by Norman Podhoritz, who was at the time the editor of Commentary about his youth uh, and it was, it's called Making It. And my experience of the book is totally different from either the way he intended it or the way other people read it, which is I read it as this like glamorous portrayal of New York intellectuals. Um, he meant it almost like as a critique and then people, he was roundly condemned for it because people thought he was like a pompous ass in it anyway. But I read it as like, wow, wouldn't it be great to talk about ideas all day and, you know, go to these dinner parties. I forgot, like, I know nothing about dinner parties. My mother never had dinner parties. I, I to this day, I can't throw dinner parties. Um, I don't go to dinner parties. Uh, but anyway, so that was kind of, I, and I had, when Steve discovered Reason, that I thought, oh, what I would like to do when I grow up is be the editor of Reason Magazine, which was a completely ridiculous um, aspiration because for one thing, Reason was located in Santa Barbara, California which when does your life ever take you to Santa Barbara, California? Never. And then through a remarkable coincidence, in 1986, um, I got married among other things and Steve got a job at UCLA and we were moving to UC uh, we were moving to LA. I had been working for Inc. Magazine and I'd worked out a deal with my editor where I was gonna go to half time so I could freelance half time. And Lo and behold, Reason moved from Santa Barbara to LA and it had an opening for an assistant editor. And I applied and I got that job. And a few years later, Marty Zupan, who was the editor, and some of you may know her from her time at IHS, um, she left to go to IHS and eventually became the president of IHS. Um, and I became the editor. I mean, 
there's a little more steps in there, but that was basically the story. And then I did that for 10 years and then I was 40 and I was like, you know, this is great, but I don't really want to do this anymore. <laughs> I wanted to just write books and write columns and just work for myself. I love that. Thank you, Virginia. Um, any other general advice about the life of a writer, for example, taking rejection? You were both in a position to give a lot of rejection as editor. You got you got pitched yes. a lot, but but as a book author and as a columnist yourself, I know you had established columns at our nation's foremost uh, newspapers. But uh, I mean, being being a creative, being being a writer comes with a bit of rejection. So, any advice on on that? Yeah. Well. You know, it's tough. And, and I mean, I, I say it took me a long time to learn that if you don't feel like you're failing, uh, you're not ambitious enough. <laughs> and I mean, I really, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I've had a wonderful career and I've been lucky. I mean, you know, I, I've been prepared, but I've also been lucky. I mean, who would think that coincidence of all those things that took for me to be editor of reason? I mean, that was, I was prepared, but I had no control over the circumstances that made that possible. Um, but it's, you know, it is a part of, of life. And I, you know, I was fired from the Atlantic. Um, and, you know, it was, it wasn't because I did something bad. It was because of the fallout of the, um, recession and the, you know, financial crisis, but, you know, that wasn't fun. <laughs> um, and, um, and I was, uh, and, and so, you know, we've all had problems. My first job, I had a great first job as a reporter at the Wall Street Journal in the long defunct Philadelphia Bureau, but it didn't really, I was kind of miserable um, because, first of all, my boyfriend lived was in graduate school in MIT, and I was in Philadelphia, and there was that whole thing. Um, but also, it, while I was really interested in business and I was really interested in the kinds of features that the journal did, I realized at that young age, first of all, I was way too inexperienced for that job. And they would not hire a 22-year-old for that job now. But in those days, they used to hire their interns a lot. And then their idea was that they would train them and you'd spend like your career at the Wall Street Journal. It was a very sort of, it was a, a model that was becoming out of date even while I was there. Um, but it, it was very much that sort of company man kind of model of mid 20th century. Um, but I realized that I didn't, I liked learning things. I liked doing interviews. I like, but I was never going to be the kind of person who was really good at finding out things that people didn't want you to know, which was the kind of person who really got ahead in that world. Um, was, you know, that was the most valuable thing was finding out things that people didn't want you to know. And that wasn't me. And I, I was fortunate that I was able to get a job at Inc. Magazine writing about small business for a couple of years. And I, most important, it was in Boston. So I guess, you know, be with Steve. Um, and, and I had a very good editor there. Also, my editor at the Wall Street Journal, the guy who hired me was a great editor. But between the time he hired me and the time I started work, because my senior year, he left, for, I mean, he went to another job at the journal. And I got this guy who was a terrible editor and all of us wanted him to get fired the whole time, but he stayed like forever. And I have the guy who was the senior reporter in the bureau said he must've had something on somebody. But anyway, so I was kind of miserable there and I was fortunate to get to Inc and had a much better experience. And, you know, and it was a much better match for me. So part of it is there are things you can control. There are things you can't control. But one thing you can control is trying to figure out, you know, who you are and what you are good at and what you are bad at. And don't try to do the stuff that you're bad at. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's also really valuable to do reporting, to especially when you're young, 
um, and frankly don't know that much. Um, which in retrospect, I can tell like what an idiot I was when I was 23 or whatever. I, you know, I was smart, but I didn't know stuff. And so, you know, the more you can read and talk to people, whether it's directly for something that you're working on or just for your own edification, the better off you'll be. Hmm. I, uh, I want to, I have one more last question on that exact. And here I am spilling on myself. <laughs> Very glamorous. <laughs> one last question on that exact topic before we open it up to the floor for, for some Q and A, but, um, I, one piece of book advice I really enjoyed, uh, was from Tyler Cowan's blog, Marginal Revolution, where he said, don't write a book, only write a book if you feel like it's a disease and writing it is the cure. And that's exactly how I feel about my book. Like I just haven't been able, I'm like kind of possessed by the idea and just can't, I won't be able to kind of sleep until it's done. So I'm curious, um, you know, whether or not someone in this space has a, you know, burning idea to write a book. Maybe they want to write a book someday. They like the idea of it. What are some kind of habits of mind of like continued learning just to kind of keep your mind sharp and to, and to, um, to keep growing in, in your knowledge and curiosity about the world around us that might lead to to like kind of a burning desire, um, like what you've had with all of all of your different book projects. Yeah, well, a lot of them come. A lot of it comes from reading, reading widely. Um, but this this book is an interesting example because ultimately, when people ask me why, how did I come to write this book? When I go back to the things that inspired it, it was a lot of going to academic conferences and hearing a talk that I didn't expect to hear. I mean, in one case, it was extreme because I went to hear this talk at UCLA because, which was on ambergris, which is the stuff from whales that they used to use to make perfumes. And it was partly kind of glamour related maybe. And um, also the, the person who was giving the paper was the, thesis advisor of a friend of mine. Um, so I thought I would go and say, you know, Howard says hello. And then this woman before him gave this talk about Brazil wood, which was uh, a, a wood from Brazil. Um, it, it's what the country was named for. That was used as a dye stuff, a red dye stuff. And the quantities that were being exported out of uh, the Spanish or uh, Portuguese, Span it was actually Spanish colonies. It wasn't just in Brazil, but Spanish colonies that she had records of were astounding. And also the fact that there were these records and that historians had only recently looked at them and they were like 500 years old was amazing. And so that kind of thing, and then exhibits I happened to see at the museum at FIT, things like that, you know, just, kind of take in stuff from the world. Yeah. Um, I think there, there's different ways of writing a book. I mean, they're, they're the kind of books I write, which are big category killers. They're meant to not never go out of print. I mean, they might, but I hope that they will never go out of print. Um, and they take years to write and even more years to have thought about before they write. And then you live with them and you give talks about them and all of that stuff. And then sometimes people write books that are in some sense, I, I mean, I have been known to call them not real books, but they have a much more immediate purpose. They have, um, somebody has an idea that they just want to get in something called a book in a hurry to get it out into the public sphere. And people write those, I mean, um, some of some of Glenn Reynolds books fall into that category um, and because he's been very good at tapping uh, certain at identifying certain trends really quickly and he hasn't done the kind of work that he would do if he were publishing a, a law of review article and wearing his academic uh, hat but you know he's a good writer and he's insightful and so he writes a different kind of book. But so I don't think Tyler is necessarily right that you should only write it if it's like a disease. Um, but I do think, at least for the kind of book that I write, I'm only going to write it if I really want to explore it and really want to delve into it and ideally really want people to read it. Um, although The Power of Glamour, I mostly wrote for myself and the sales show it. <laughs> 
I love that. Well, I'll open it up to, um, I'll give it to Casey to open up to some questions, but thank you, Virginia. I love those, that encouragement to kind of be uh, intellectually omnivorous, to constantly be looking at, you know, different um, sources of knowledge and experiences to keep you fresh and surprising as a writer. Thank you very much for that. Absolutely. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to type in the chat box. Um, I see a few questions here um, and I'll also open it up if people have live questions they want to ask perhaps right after this one. Um, I see one question. Um, John Hersey has sent a few questions, but I like this first one you have most. Um, he is asking a, a question kind of related to the future and its enemies. Um, he says, I love how at the start of the future and its enemies, you begin with the story of Tomorrowland and use it as a jumping off point for illustrating contrasting attitudes towards the future and freedom. It seems that you have a keen sense for appealing to common rational values as a means of opening up the door for persuasion. Do you have any principles of pro-liberty, pro-reason persuasion that you think too few people understand? So kind of related to the future and its enemies, but also general principles of persuasion for liberty. Well, I think that, you know, this goes back to my Wall Street Journal experience and my Wall Street, so I emphasize the negative parts of it, but it, it was really in many ways a great experience and taught me a lot. And I also, the Wall Street Journal was the first newspaper that I read regularly that was good so because my dad used to get it um i when i was at reason i used to tell one of the things i used to tell people a lot when i was editing them is give people something they can picture and this is something i really learned i mean i was a very good writer when i started it in journalism i was a very good writer when i was 12. i mean you know in terms of putting sentences together but there are techniques that journalists have evolved over time that are effective. And one of them is use of anecdotes and descriptions. And when I started in journalism, I tended to think very abstractly uh, because that's a type of mind I have. And actually, so the journal helped me a lot. And particularly there's there's a book and I can look it up and put it in the chat. There's a book that's still in print called The Art and Craft Feature Writing by William Blundell. And it's the book that I used to give everybody when I was at Reason, our interns, the people who were starting, because it's one of the few books that integrates the reporting with the writing. It doesn't just tell you how to make nice sentences. It tells you how to tell a story. And Bill Blundell used to give workshops for report, young reporters at the journal. And I learned a lot from that. But then when I went to Inc, I had this great editor, Stephen, Steve Solomon is his name. And he actually now, he's been a journalism professor for many years. And now he does First Amendment work and has intersected some with my uh, friends at fire. Um, but he used to write on the sides of our column, our, our articles, weak and vague. And that's all he would write. He wouldn't write a question. He would just write weak and vague. And we would go, what the hell? It's totally clear to me. <laughs> but having to make it not weak and not vague taught me a lot. And I think that, I mean, that's a, it's not a principle about like, communicating libertarian ideas it's a communicate it's a principle about communicating in general so give people things that they can picture may find analogies find patterns um you know give people emotional content address them as full human beings um so that's and, and by emotional content, I don't mean own the lips. I mean, you know, I, I don't mean get their get their anger up. I mean, you know, relate to them as human beings, engage their sympathies, uh, that, that sort of thing. Casey, do you mind if I ask a follow-up related to that? Absolutely, go ahead. Thank you. So one of the things I've noticed with a lot of pro-liberty writers is that they're basically waiting for something bad to happen for them to attack instead of looking out at the world, thinking about the things that they value, 
how to protect those things and then appealing to those values. And I think that it certainly is a part of, of any sort of persuasion is that you've got to take on an opposing view. But I'm wondering if you have ever thought and, and put more weight in your own writing on making the case for the positive that you are for instead of just being against something. This is a great, it's a great question. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm multitasking here. So I'm just putting that book in the, um, in the chat. So this is a great question because it is the story of the future and its enemies. The future and its enemies started its earliest manifestation before it was what it was. As I, first, in April 1990, I published an article in Reason called The Green Road to Serfdom. And what I had done was I had read a ton of what you would what I would call green ideology. That is theoretical articles. They weren't about like how to clean the air or, you know, they weren't practical environmental policy articles. They were like, what are people getting at? And when I started this project, I thought it would be about like finding common ground and decentralization and stuff like that. But really when I read it, I was horrified because people were really into stasis and that was awful. And so I wrote this article and it's, it's, it's very young, especially at the end, but it's also sophisticated because it tells, I mean, I do delve into people, how they understand themselves and try to get into their mindset. There's a little hysterical at the end, but the, then that led to a piece that I did in the Wall Street, I mean, in the Washington Post, where I posited this idea of stasis versus dynamism as new sort of political polarities. And there are lots of things in that article that I would disagree with later uh, now and, and even a few years later, but that was kind of the first thing. And then time passed and I started developing these, theory, these ideas. Anyway, when I eventually went to write a book, um, where I had a ridiculous proposal, by the way, which I immediately, I, I managed to sell it on the basis of my work at Reason, but I didn't follow the outline at all because I would still be writing that book if I had. Um, but what I realized is I need to not, I have spent all this time understanding the enemies, like understanding the people I'm against. I need to figure out what I'm for. And that is where the structure of the book came from. It came from figuring out, okay, what are the important points of differentiation where I can make the positive case? I mean, I am arguing with people. It's called the future and its enemies, but it's not all about them. It's mostly about me or, you know, it's mostly about dynamism. And so that is where that was the sort of origins of the book was very much exactly what you're saying, um, which is I need to use this project to think more deeply about what I'm for and to communicate that to people in a persuasive way. Um, and that's also why, you know, the first chapter is a terrible that it's the first chapter. Fortunately, I had that preface, but uh, it's, it's like the hardest to get through. It's the most dated. It's, you know, because it's just about like these people really say these crazy things. They're really bad, boo. Um, and you've never heard of most of them, especially now. But once you get into the rest of the book, it's still, even though the examples might be dated, it still stands the test of time because it's about what I'm for and making that case. Great. I think we have time for one or possibly two more questions uh, in the five minutes. Um, does anyone have a question? Um, feel free. You can just unmute yourself at this point. I don't want to monopolize, but I do have a couple more. If <laughs> That's yeah, funny. sure. Go ahead. Okay. So um, one of the things that strikes me about your writing is this ability to bring in unexpected connections between ideas. And so um, I'm just wondering if you have a, a 
uh, a considered part of your writing process in which that is your focus. You're, you're focused on, okay, here I'm going to go look for like interesting concretes that are going to illustrate this point in an unexpected way. Right. So I'm always looking for, you know, as, as you say, concretes that illustrate general points, but to some degree, this is the opposite of focus. That is, it just comes to me. It's just, I make these connections. So the, 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 um, one of my favorites is in the substance of style where I analogize uh, neo-Gothic architecture to dreadlocks. And, um, you know, I didn't really, I, I was trying to explain how a, a stylistic movement or, or something stylistic could go from being ideologically freighted to becoming more and more sort of popular and, and how its meaning gets diluted but doesn't disappear completely. And I had these two examples. And I'm pretty sure I started with neo-Gothic architecture as an example to illustrate that point, but somehow just dreadlocks occurred to me. And, and that was great. Um, and I remember I gave a talk at the uh, Savannah College of Art and Design about that book. And there was a woman with dreadlocks uh, who was a professor there who was very happy. She said she really liked that, that that was in there. And she liked it because, well, she had dreadlocks so she could relate to it, but also because it was taking something from the black experience and just treating it as like an ordinary human thing, not like a special black thing or, you know, something that it was, it was like, you know, treating it as something that everybody should relate to. Um, but it's partly just a matter of having lots and lots of examples, uh, you know, in your head that could work. I mean, I really do. This is just like, it comes to me. I get massages when it's not COVID. And, you know, sometimes I have these ideas or it's like, I think of them while I'm, I've, after I've, after the alarm has gone off, but before I actually get out of bed, um, you know, when you're kind of in that, that state um, or while I'm going to sleep. Uh, that, so it's really, a lot of them come to me when my mind is drifting, as opposed to when I'm actively looking for something. Uh, another example was one that's key to the, the power of glamour, which was the idea that glamour is like humor and it operates in a similar way. And that just kind of like one day, oh, glamour is like humor. <laughs> it was like a light bulb. Sorry, no, no great tips. <laughs> but sometimes if you just sit down with a pad and just start writing things down, um, and I find that it works better with a pad and pencil than on the computer, even though I do 99% of my writing on the computer, uh, sometimes that can work. Um, and I remember being on a train, I forget going where, and doing this with the organization of the substance of style and the idea about function, pleasure, and meaning being the the things that designers work with and uh, and that sort of thing. And it was just like me writing down ideas. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Virginia. That is just about all the time we have. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you. And thank you, Alexandra, for the excellent questions. Um, like I mentioned, uh, I we hope to do more of these conversations in the future. So all of you in the audience, stay tuned for, for more. Um, and I'll make sure to distribute a recording of this conversation to our writers as well. So hopefully even more people will be watching. Um, thanks so much for your time and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm.